So this is episode 35 of the Treatment Room Secrets podcast. So super cool. You know, every time I reach a little uh, milestone, which is, for now is in fives, um, hopefully when I reach 50, then maybe I'll start counting those milestones in tens. Um, <laughs> but this is a nice one. So 35 episodes. So thank you for being here. Thank you for um, having me. I'm here with uh, Lara Colisar. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Yes, Colisar. Colisar. Um, we're here in uh, Boulder, Colorado. My second time in Boulder. Um, cool place. We're in this uh, pretty neat studio. Uh, music studio, um, Stone Stone Cottage Studios. Um, so super cool being here. I, you know, we spent uh, I guess a decent amount of time together the last couple of days. We had dinner on Sunday. We spent the day in the studio yesterday together. The whole day, yeah. um, I had the privilege of undergoing a couple of your sessions, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll dive into. Um, a couple of them. One was uh, a seated one, and one was a uh, me laying. Mm -hmm. um, and I also got to witness you working with another individual, mm -hmm. uh, which was super cool. Um, so can we start by just me asking you, what is somatic language? Mm, yes. Well, the somatic language, uh, somatic means of the body. So the body itself has a way of communicating. It's communicating to us all the time. And that language is a language that is underneath like the meaning making that our cognitive mind makes, the meaning making of words and images. Underneath that is the felt sense, the body sense. So the sensations in the body, which are made up of... So is that what you call the felt, the felt sense? Yeah, that's another word. Felt sense was coined um, by Eugene Gendlin who was a psychotherapist who did this study around how people, how people excel in their self-connection. And what they found was that people who reference their body sensations, how they're feeling, when they take the moment to pause and listen to what's happening in their inner world of their bodies, they have more capabilities of being uh, of excelling in their self-development, in um, becoming more self-reliant in who they are. Anyway, so the body, this somatic language is a language that our body's intelligence speaks to us in sensations made up of texture, uh, shape, uh, location. It's something that... Um, it's similar to like if we look at a landscape and we just take in the textures of the landscape yeah. without like zero in on one thing. It's it's that aspect, but it's in our inner world. And you think or I think, but um, the, you, we, we believe or we think there's a reason for that communication or those signals from within the body um are we are we assuming that there's a reason why if we do take a second and listen and or focus our attention within um we might spot areas of communication um so we're assuming that those are signals for something yes well it can be uh as basic as knowing when you're thirsty or hungry uh, those basic cues, um, when you're tired, all these experiences we have, these cues are made up of sensations in the body, right? And so that's also inclusive of when we are feeling um, anxious, stressed, or when we feel uh, drawn to move towards something yeah. or away from something. So it helps us get connected to our unique preferences, and that can be a really valuable tool for people because right now we are inundated mm -hmm. with the how to's, how to live in this body. Yeah. You know, I mean, we know so many different ways of diets, exercise systems. And really, I think that it becomes important to listen to these inner cues, this language, so that we can connect to what our unique body needs and that we don't override that. What do you see as the uh, maybe biggest challenge for someone, for the person that, let's say, is open um, to uh, focusing their attention 
to such a thing yeah. um what is that person's biggest challenge so for me yesterday sitting with you or laying with you i i was you know i was completely open to the experience yeah. um and i hope that you notice that that my my attention was focused within and trying to make something out of these signals with your guidance yeah. what is the biggest challenge for someone like myself who's like maybe you know for the f you know not I don't want to say for the first time because I think ongoingly I think we do this probably more than we think on little you know bits and pieces yeah. and I mentioned yesterday especially when we're forced to when you get hit somewhere or if something you know it tweaks or is strained or broken yeah. then you're forced to put your attention to, the, to that area and then it's very clear to get that piece of communication from the body like when you're thirsty i think it's very obvious when you're thirsty to understand that piece of communication um so not for the first time but maybe for the first time spending i don't know how many minutes 45 minutes 30 minutes focusing on my you yeah. know my internal communication what is the biggest challenge there yes. you think um well there's a number of challenges um one of them is that people will question or doubt what they're feeling right? Because we're so used to language being distinct. Um, we're, we always are looking for uh, certainty yep. and clarity. Where Things the, that make sense. Yeah. 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 And, and things that make sense because we're oriented towards more um, visual outer, which is like the exterioception, right? How our five senses receives the outer world, different than how we receive our inner world. And the inner world is less distinct, especially in the beginning, it can feel like vague and emergent um, and it's shifting and changing. And so what happens a lot of times from when people are first connecting to that is that with intention, right? So as we said, like we're feeling it all the time, those sensations are there. But yep. when we put our focus attention, our conscious awareness, there can be like doubt, oh, yeah, I'm not really feeling anything, um, or it's not strong enough, so it doesn't it might it doesn't mean anything. I don't understand it, and so there becomes questioning, doubt, and then making it irre irre irrelevant. Yeah, right. Well, I, I think that it, like without your guidance yesterday, yeah, um, I definitely would have struggled more to yes, you know, even to decipher when to put like put my attention into trying to describe the feeling that I'm feeling um so for example if I was maybe doing it alone completely yes um you know focusing my attention on my breath on my stomach for example with my the touch of my hands yes maybe I would be receiving signals but I probably wouldn't have been trying to label them or categorize them or trying to understand them uh, so I think that's where your guidance came in and I think because of your guidance of maybe in a delicate way of the word um, forcing me to uh, put a word to the feelings or the communication or the signals that I'm um, receiving helped me understand them yes. more because when you like asked me to maybe use a word to describe that bit of communication that I'm trying that my maybe my body is trying to deliver to me um, so immediately I'm trying to think of words yes. um, but I wasn't saying the first word that came to mind because usually the first word to, that came to mind was there to answer your question. Mm. Um, and then when I, without using my, you know, without saying it out loud, but internally hearing a word that maybe would sound right as an answer to you yes. did not necessarily fit what I was feeling. So because that initial word that I could have answered, yes. I could have said that my body is sending me signals that uh, it, is, it is tired. Yeah. which probably would have, again, ticked the box from mm -hmm. the outside if someone's looking at our session. Uh, but as soon as a, a thought like that arised in my brain, my I, I did realize that it wasn't the right word to use. So now I'm like, mm. you know, digging through different w words and um, to describe what is that feeling. So yes. maybe the alternative that I came out and did say out loud wasn't the um, exact piece of communication that I received from my body but maybe it was closer to it. Yes. 
And you did mention uh, like the importance of like repetition in these things. Yes. Um, so is it with your experience that, you know, over time, these things do become less vague? Yes. Well, so uh, such a, yeah, you're, you're, you're really zeroing in. I'm on... trying, I'm trying to uh, paint the picture for myself, yes, really, you know, yes. because it is, I know how uh, ambiguous it is. Yeah. One of the things is that, um, well, I try and re remind um, people that I work with is that when I ask questions, it's, I'm not asking the question to get a right answer. The question is the, is to bring the atten it's to bring your attention, your uh, focus attention to create the neural pathways to connect to the information. And since we're not habituated to pay attention to that on a regular basis, those neural pathways aren't as strong. And so by me asking the question, it sends the curiosity and starts sending those neural pathways so that the brain starts to receive the information and be curious about what it evokes. Because really what you're experiencing on the inside is evoking meaning making in your brain. So even though, let's say your first impulse was like the tired thing, that is also part of it. But I, what you're describing is that you're, there was a part of you that was realizing, ah, there's something closer. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that coming closer to it is where we're getting to like the, the basic building blocks. We're getting to the core of the issue more by dropping into what might be hard to describe. Because it is, if, if we think about it, it's energy that's emerging that's starting to take form, right? If we think about ourselves that what animates us, our aliveness, is life force. And life force at first doesn't have quite form, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to grasp it. But it animates us so that we take form. And it takes form through creating flesh and bone, our beating hearts, but also it takes form in expression. So even like we're talking about voice, the sound of my voice is energy that's vibrating, it's taking form. And so by being in that curious uh, inquiry with what's happening in your body, you are making this neural connection with your brain to what's taking form in your body. And that what I found is that that information is directly connected to, it's like, I don't know if you want to call it your soul or your, your essence or the you-ness that wants to express itself in the world. And the more we listen to those inner sensations, you get closer to the essence of you, the uniqueness of you, as opposed to, you know, framing it from some theory or, you know, something that maybe your teacher told you or your parents told you, because everyone has a perspective on you from the outside, but yep. only you can connect to this inner guidance and sensations. And I think that's a pretty cool thing to have access to. You have traveled quite a bit, right? You live in Portland? Yes. Um, do you find, based on where you travel, that like this topic is maybe received better by you know, even geographically, by certain <laughs> communities, certain cities, certain people. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I do see how something like this can, again, easily, you know, be thrown into like pseudoscience bucket and let's ignore it because it's, uh, you know, it's crazy stuff. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, so I spent uh, seven years in Europe, uh, in the Amsterdam area. And I know that's um, why I assumed you were Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, but I'm, I'm my mother's French. Yeah. So I, I definitely have this attraction to Europe and to uh, that kind of mixture of culture. And that what's I find interesting is, yes, in, in Europe, there's a because there's maybe a little bit of soft, a little bit softer drive than Americans have, you know, the U S has a particular, like, mm -hmm. Oh, go get air, get, you know, and, and it's happening in Europe too, because we influence Europe very much, but there is less, um, there's less attention on, sh of, of, um, being, uh, of 
that the importance of uh, striving at the forefront and being a personality. Mm -hmm. So Make, there's a, making it succeeding, all that yeah. stuff. There's more sense of like being a community that there is a sense of there is a, a communal identity as opposed to an individuated identity. Mm -hmm. And what that does with the nervous system is it creates a little bit more less, um, uh, a little bit more relaxed quality around the exploration and the not knowing. I find that in the U.S., the not knowing has a, is, um, is scarier. <laughs> and so... A fear can create also a block to connecting to these inner sensations. Because sometimes people are confronted by that what they feel on the inside may not match what they think they should be, yeah. what they think they're striving towards. And that can be confronting to people. So do you think um, the effect on the nervous system is by going at it to succeed alone? Yeah. As your personal brand, does that somewhat put you in a like a flight or f uh, fight situation to some degree in life? Because it's me against the world. Like mm -hmm. we we know that phrase, right? It's mm -hmm. just I'm gonna take over the world. I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna succeed um, alone. Yeah. Um. So having that community, that almost like safety net around you, uh, can allow you to explore the unknown without getting punished. Uh, because maybe if you do, let's say, because if you there's one thing, you know, pushing yourself to a more individualistic life yeah. uh, versus a communal life. Yes. Um, but there's people that are also, you know, in a way um, conditioned and maybe forced down that, you know, individual pathway. Um, so someone like that who, you know, forced maybe because maybe they don't have a family, maybe they never yeah. made friends. Yeah. So to some degree, they are at it alone. Yeah. Are those people you think less likely to uh, look within, mm. communicate within, understand what internally their spirit is the word you used or yeah, well, your the you, essence. your essence? Um, mm -hmm. Is that is it harder for them to connect to their essence? Well, that depends. You know, I think um, it because there is a possibility that if someone is, let's say. Um, working towards that individual expression, mm -hmm. it's very possible that they have a self-reflective um, inquiry to connect, to have that match. So there is that possibility that as I am looking to express who I am, that if I take the time to, ref to receive the feedback, so there's a, there's a feedback loop, right? I receive the information of the outer world, my connection even to you. So that becomes more of like, I'm receiving you as information, as a connection. And then my body responds to that. And then I listen to those responses. I translate that and then it becomes expression. I respond back. So there's this, always this feedback loop. Automatically almost. Yes. It goes on. Now yeah. it, a lot of times what can happen is that people don't listen to those inner cues. They're just always in the outer. So they have an agenda. Um, they're, they're pushing a kind of exterior expression of the individualistic as opposed to the individualistic expression that is connected to your expression, that it's coherent. So there's this whole concept of coherence in... Uh, because we are all sharing the same, you know, we're, when we're breathing, we're sharing the same air. We are, um, ex we're, we're tapping into the life force that is mm -hmm. in the same room. We are feeling each other and we're reflecting back to each other, different aspects of ourselves, yep. right? And in that, when we're open to that, when we receive that and respond to that subtlety, that creates more, um, it's like a balance between the individual me and the collective, right? The, which I like the word coherence, because then it feels like there's connection as opposed to I'm pushing my agenda as a personality and then you are, mm. and that can feel dissonant, Yeah. right? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. No, and I think like, in my opinion, at least, like if we approached it that way, even here today. Yes. Like, I don't think this would work. You know what I mean? I don't think we could, I could ask you a question, you could answer. I could ask you a question, you could answer. But I don't think we'd be like building yeah. something together, whatever that is. Um, so let's see what we build here. But do you, th- so do you, so in Europe, were people more, do you find people more generally receptive to within? I think there is a, a, a there is a, a a willingness. Um, yeah, there's a willingness to connect to that inner world, especially as their guidance system. Mm-hmm. Um, when I've done some workshops in the U.S., it's a little bit more like, yeah, that the there is that tendency to be like, mm, this is not clear enough. I can't uh, this. This inner information um, is not the it's not the clear me that I want to have the outer world see. Whereas in, in Europe, I it seems like there's more of a willingness to let that be an emerging, like an authenticity, like that I can be an imperfection. Mm. Uh, I'm an I'm I'm something that is a process yeah. that's that's coming into form yeah. as opposed to, I need to have it all be uh, clearly defined. Yeah. I know what the world's like. I'm going to give you my, you know, my one, two, three. I mean, there's, I'm always surprised by <laughs> a young, um, yeah, I would say influencers who really have a sense of certainty. Like I'm, I'm 53 and I'm still, I'm still finding life so, mysterious and it's always showing me new things and i love being in that fresh perspective of life showing me that i don't know everything yeah and yet in that um i can also uh resource all that i've practiced as the knowing of experience yeah and that there's something that's trustable in the uh, this intelligence that's beyond just my ideas of who I am. I think that a lot of people, again, influencers, you know, online, um, different companies, books, people are definitely attracted to people that express certainty. Yes. Uh, maybe it's provide some comfort, relief, safety net. Yes. Knowing that you don't know, but the person that you follow or the person that you read their book or the person that you pray to yes. knows, yeah. Dot, period. Yeah. Um, but in- interestingly enough, I think it's creating a huge amount of anxiety in our culture <laughs> as well. <laughs> so mm. it's a paradox because the expression of certainty, then what happens is that with that certainty, I'm going to compare myself to that certainty. Yeah. And then that activates a sense like, well, I don't feel as certain as that expression, the influ- influencer that's expressing that certainty. Yeah. And that's not true. It's because we, because also we, I think we acknowledge that like the whole social media thing is causing anxiety because of the whole, you know, comparing yourself to all these mm-hmm. millions of people around the world that are driving Ferraris and are living life. So we, but we attach it to a very materialistic yeah. point of view. Um, but you're saying so also just from the sense of, you know, listening to someone that acts as if they're certain and they yes. know everything. Um, even if I outwardly express that I agree with that person and I follow that person, it's probably causing some discomfort yes. from within because I probably deep down either know that that person doesn't really know mm-hmm. is one angle that I'm thinking of. Angle number two is now I'm actually feeling insecure because how does that person know? And I don't know mm. why have they figured it out and I haven't figured right. it out. It's so common. I I'm attracted to, and this is also like kind of what this podcast is. Um, yeah. Again, we're not here to say we know anything really. Yes. Um, it's to really hear people's experiences and you know what they have seen and what they have done yes. and hopefully you know, we're getting like little bits and pieces from different um, angles and to try and put something together yes. you know but not to um, again not to put the perfect puzzle together that we know yeah. um, but just to 
kind of get a grasp of maybe how much we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's the point. Um, we're going to say something? Uh, oh. Yeah, it just brings me back to another, it's like a shift in perspective that this inner, this, this experience that I have, like my body as this instrument of perception, that as I turn towards the uh, information it receives, there's a whole other rich inner world that emerges. There's a, there's, there can be a sense of knowing and peace uh, in relationship to this whole outer world that's happening. That when I can find more, uh, when I develop more habit, because it, it, I think it does require a returning back over and over again to this inner feeling sense, that when I do that, that there's like, I can take with me this, it's, it's a different kind of certainty. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling quality of, um, it, yeah, and you can see how even right now, as I'm searching for the words, that's when I know I'm, I'm in contact with it because it, it feels, uh, it feels like centered. It feels peaceful. And yet also I can feel right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm experiencing this, you know, you know, it's a whole, you know, having this headset on and mm -hmm. we're talking to the microphones. And so I have a little bit of my, the nerves, the part of me that has a little like, uh, oh, every once in a while I become self-conscious of the fact mm -hmm. we're being recorded. <laughs> so there's yeah. a slight activation of my nervous system. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I presence that, I allow myself to feel how there's a little tightness around my face or in my chest. And I, I breathe it in and in be and let it be inclusive to this experience. Then I can be in the awe of like this experience. This is new for me. Yeah. Um, I no, I was gonna say like maybe you know. Um, I like finishing a day yeah. where you know I look back and oh, I've I've accomplished everything that I wanted. You know, everything that I prioritized that I knew that I could accomplish that day and I set to accomplish and I accomplished it that day or completed it that day that gives me a sense of relief a sense of comfort a sense of you know putting my legs up at the end of the day and thinking yes. um that i you know i feel accomplished i feel uh, satisfied at least for that day until i wake up the next morning right but when i was doing this session with you yesterday yes um almost like taking the time and connecting to the within um helped me maybe see that a lot is going on besides my you know helping people during the day or doing my work or yes. working out or you know reading and doing everything i set to do that day there's so much more that goes on that i, I am doing yes that's not this express expressive actions and animated actions in the real world yeah. but from within uh, so maybe that provides some sense sense of comfort uh because at the end of the day a lot of things you're accomplishing a lot of things um without even noticing so maybe connecting um uh, maybe it was an expression of gratitude maybe it was like you know um, um i'm almost you know you and you almost feel like there is like a, almost another person inside you that you're communicating with mm. um that almost like tells you that i'm i'm, I'm functioning i'm doing my this is my experience by the mm -hmm. way functioning doing my job there's a lot to do and I'm doing it all the time since you were born. I'm doing it today and I'll keep doing it. Yes. Um, treat me nicely. That's kind of the message that, mm. that, that I received. And mm. it was comforting just knowing that I think more is accomplished than I would like to imagine. You know, someone that is so maybe, you know, people that are depressed and, you know, lay in bed all day and maybe don't, um, you know, they do much. I think can, you know, hurt a person because even me, you know, if I have a, a day where I'm, or two days where I'm lazy, you know, quote unquote, not doing much and you, all of your attention during that, that time is maybe on an entertainment, yeah. um, then you feel super empty and depleted by the end of that. Um, but maybe even during those days of laziness, of not taking action or doing much if you took the time to look within and understand that even in those moments you're functioning you're you know metabolizing you're expressing energy in many different ways 
um, can provide some sense of comfort and relief and comf- inner confidence as well, I think. Where did this uh, start or come in into your life? Like, how was one even introduced to this? You know, I was introduced to this uh, through you mm-hmm. um, and I'll keep learning and exploring. Um, where did it start for you? How were you introduced to it? And what was that experience like in terms of you being receptive to it? Mm. That's a really good question. Well, when I, okay, so when I've always been a very a physically oriented person, kinesthetic. So I engage in the world through movement, Um, whether it's been like uh, sports activities or I love to dance and move. I love to uh, get out and um, I love hiking. I love all, you know, just movement itself brings me into a state of self-connection. And so that was just a natural part of who I was. Now, when I Went to I went to massage school at the Boulder School of Massage Therapy, which is now the Boulder College. Uh, Fancy, yeah, yeah. It's massa- you know body work is like evolved and grown. And um, I started also realizing I needed to care and tend for my body because you know massage and body work is really this using your body. So I simultaneously started to study mind-body modalities like Pilates and started to realize that in order to... I think that that would have surprised, the word Pilates would have surprised um, people. It surprised me when you said studying modalities of mind-body connection. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does that surprise you? You know, I think um, if I think about it, it doesn't. Um, But on the surface of it, I think, you know... um, at least, and again, I've been to Pilates classes um, in different places, different yeah. communities. It seems like there is a, you know, a very like dry workout yes. um, connection to Pilates nowadays. Just like I think we were talking about a couple of days ago, that also, you know, um, vari- variations of yoga is also kind of becoming like that. But, yes. but sorry. So yes, you're studying mind body yeah. connection uh, modalities such as everything Pilates. is everything can be turned into uh, like a yeah. uh, um, a goal oriented and i think yeah. that's what's happened to pilates now is that it's turned into this like three uh, sets of 10 right which is that's not the original intention of it it really was about um finding the like uh, a uniform development right it's it's about how do you find that the whole system can be engaged in a uniform way and that when you do movements, that includes the the, the core of you, that the movements ha- are, uh, yeah, the word is uniform. So like uniform meaning like I'm going to engage evenly all the muscles of my body. I'm going to find where the the centers of my joints are so that I can move through this alignment of, of the biomechanics of me. Mm-hmm. And what I realized is that I didn't have a sense of where that center was automatically. I had to have someone tell me, oh, you know, you're pushing through that, you know, you're, as you push your foot, you are pushing a little bit more from the outside of your leg. And so then I was like, well, how do I feel that, what they're telling me I'm doing? Because otherwise it's just a, I'm trying to imitate, I'm trying to just do something compensate to go the other direction. So I started getting very curious about how can I feel what someone is noticing from the outside, right? Like my alignment in my nervous system is not, it's been, it's a compensatory alignment and it's imbalanced because of of how I've used it, um, which usually is connected to even like uh, how our parents move, um, how we hold tension, um, being a female, maybe how I might cover my chest or how, you know, how I am socially. And so when I started studying Pilates with um, teachers that were really about feeling the alignment, then I started to realize I have to get connected to that felt sense. And it's that subtle sensations of where centering is. And that I realized I could use, I could start to feel where my bones were. Like if I find my skeleton first and then organize my muscles around that, 
then I found where our true center was in my body. There's a tendency in the whole like fitness world is to focus just on the muscles. But the muscles are, they're just like, they are in service to something else. There's the structure of our body, the skeletal system, that if we find the centering of it and then ask the muscles to organize around that in a uniform way, then we can move from a centering place. Then I have like, I take my center with me. I, I can feel when I am more oriented towards my muscle energy is like more in the front of my body instead of the back of my body. Can I feel that balancing quality throughout all of me? So then when I was trying lear, learning how to teach others, how do I communicate that? How do I get someone to feel that? So that I would use my hands to put them into alignment. So here, put your knee here in line with the center of your foot and the center of your hip. Here's where your head is centered. And then they're like, okay, I got it. And then they're like, well, how can I get them to feel when they're off center? So I realized I had to feel like, what does off center feel like? In relation, and then that that would inform me like, oh, when I'm off center, I feel like a, a a pull of these muscles. Oh yeah. So then if I come to the center, oh, there's less pull. Right. So then I I partner with my inner sensing to keep me feeling uh, less strain in my, you know, how I hold myself throughout the day. Why do you think it's so crazy to take the time and communicate with yourself what why do i think it's so crazy you mean yeah. like why why is it perceived to be so um uh, again out, we so have out there oh, so, because uh, there's so much focus on like uh the outer expression mm -hmm. right the the doing this getting things like you said ticking the boxes there's so, there's the boxes, right there's but, a satisfaction but still so many of us are just watching netflix for so many hours a day or when you get your iphone report and it says you've been on your iphone for average of nine hours a day i think um, that's so because, people are not getting the ticking the boxes no i think it's because we're we're looking for relief from that the tyrant of our brains that are saying do 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 mm -hmm. like i mean i don't know if you've had times where like the the checklist is endless right <laughs> And it, there's a new one that comes every day. And so what happens is we're, we're, we've developed a, a tyrant that's saying, that's a taskmaster and we want relief from that. And how do we, and the way our culture has created relief is by let's, let's distract, let's get distracted by someone else's story. Like I know myself, sometimes I, I, I welcome that relief. I love to immerse myself in a, a video series or, yeah. or, but that's, there's other like forms of that, like music. Music is a wonderful way to kind of uh, take us out of um, our, our checklist to be, uh, to connect us to the now moment, the present now moment, which is where, what's real. Our checklists are things that we make up and, uh, and we make up this importance with it, yeah. but there's some kind of, uh, we've connect, created this, they, they found like a dopamine, dopamine hit when we do, when we get things done or when we, when we swipe, there's that yeah. equal thing that we're looking for, but there's only so much that we can, uh, it, it also has like a crash, like if we drink too much coffee on our system. So the inner sense is, uh, there's, there's an endless supply to the relief and connection it can provide us i was gonna say maybe to provide this a more context to the listeners yeah. um what, what is something you would say to someone even listening now where they yeah. can even pause this for a few minutes yeah um is there something they could do to themselves um that will you know, be a tiny tiny baby step to kind of get a better grasp of everything you're talking about now yeah yeah because because i can clearly see how so many people because also i was i think like that and i think i'm only scratching the surface of my not since yesterday but you know um over years and years and years and i mentioned like different injuries force you to pay attention to certain areas of your body and force you to communicate um but i can also see how so many people out there that have no almost no connection mm. to the yeah. you know the inner the inner body the inner you yeah um, so what is like a small exercise that one could do mm -hmm. good one so um first of all i want to say that uh just the fact that you and i all of you listeners out there are 
in a body, you already have this intelligence, this body sense. Yeah. And it's just a, the simple practice of turning your curiosity to even how your body is in space right now. Right. So if you're listening to us right now, noticing how you're making contact to whether you're sitting, like the subtle sensations of the pressure of the base of your body on what you're sitting on. So already right there, how your feet are contacting, just those simple things that we take for granted by putting your attention to how it feels like the, you know, what it feels like in, you know, if you have shoes on, like the texture of your sock or the floor, by putting your attention on that, you're receiving, you're putting attention to the sensations. Like th that's like the doorway, like one part. Now, the other thing that um, provides more connection is by simply putting attention in your breath. So just slowly increasing your inhale and increasing your exhale and inhaling the information, the sensations of your feet, your, where you're sitting, your torso and space. Right away, I can guarantee you there's something that's shifted, right? Shifted or at least some sort of communication yeah. that's being sent up. Yes. To the like, brain. I know all of a sudden I started to feel more spacious. Um, also, I feel a little bit of like a shift, like a tingling in my body. A little s Now, as I do that, I feel more spacious. I feel, um, yeah, time starts to expand. Like I notice I'm slowing down as I talk. Um, and so for some people, that slowing down might feel disorienting especially if someone's used to the, uh, the intensity of their contraction. That some people are actually, they get something out of that because it pushes them to get those checklists done. <laughs> and then they get that dopamine hit of it. So it's almost like a detoxing from that line of receptivity. And I'm not saying that, you know, that there needs to be like a complete putting aside of your checklist, but just taking these moments, giving the nervous system of rest and a break and shifting that attention allows the inclusiveness of this other intelligence. It may not make sense right away, but just by putting your attention there allows for there being a dialogue, a syncing up of this inner sensations, weight, pressure, how I'm holding myself. I might even start to feel like, oh, I was holding a little tension in my shoulders. So now I just start feeling, oh, moving my shoulders a little bit. Oh, that I can relax them on my back. I just took a deeper breath. Hmm. Yeah, body scan. They call it now yep. in um, <clears throat> somatic therapy, scanning the body. I found personally what has helped me um, even before approaching things this way um, was simply like, um, you know, I like filming myself working out sometimes, whatever I'm doing, um, especially when it's something new, a new exercise or a new pose or a new stretch, just to see what I look like. And so many times that has helped me scan my body, but literally through a video, um, it made me realize the dissonance there that's mm. within my body mm -hmm. uh, where I think performing this pose, my hips are completely aligned yeah. because the, my brain is telling me that they feel completely aligned, uh, but on the video, absolutely not. I'm obviously favoring one side or, you know, one in front of the other. And that has helped me over and over again, realize disbalances also in my body. And, but mainly the, maybe the, lack of awareness that i have without the technology you know without having a video of myself yes and because that's what you're, you're saying right this like body scan is there to to do that and you can do that without filming yourself yes um and it's it gets even deeper than that literally because 
we can't film what's going on within yes not to um you know not to these um levels correct me if i'm wrong um but like you know all the scans that we do and all these x-rays all that stuff is very you know surface level to some degree or very um you know i don't think it, it hits these bits of communication we can't scan ourselves and get that communication like i was getting yesterday or trying to get yesterday yeah. you know milking out of my system some communication towards yes. me where do you think the importance of touch comes mm. in to mm. this specifically yeah that's uh so touch because you incorporate touch like even us we it was uh, our session included bits of me touching myself um and it um included bits of you putting pressure on me touching me yes so if we uh i, I was so if we go back to this uh perspective that the body we live in one of its primary um functionings is that it's an instrument of perception and the perceiving right so perception of receiving information is through touch and so that's inclusive of like light as light comes into our eyes there is these uh these uh the the light waves are coming in and touching the inside of my retina right smell smell or molecules touching inside our nose um taste right it's they're all forms of touch so when we bring the actual sensory touch and in our hands there's a high um concentration of receptors so we'll talk so in the nervous system this from the brain the spinal cord and then there's this a uh, network of receiving you know the nerve pathways at the end of each nerve pathway there's these uh the neuron cells have uh what's called dendrites and the dendrites are all receiving and so each neuron cell is primarily made up of a receptor and then that information goes into the what's called the axon and then up to the brain and receives and our hands have a high concentration of those receivers there's other parts of the body that have also different concentrations and so when we put attention to our hands we can receive information and and that information is receptive but what's cool about touch is that it's what they call like reflexive not only am i receiving information but i'm also can reach out and communicate information through my touch right so even in our session when i made contact by making contact you get to receive yourself even more because through my touch on my hand you are it's stimulating your own receptors of information and you're getting receiving what it's like to feel me in that moment so it's a reflexive act and so touch activates in us a um a sense of who we are and when we connect to that truth of who we are there's a relaxation i mean that's from early on when we're um in utero like when we're little fetuses in your utero that's the first thing that gets developed is our sense of touch through our skin and that provides a sense of who we are as we're developing as these physical beings distinct from our environment and then it also stimulates the the development of all our systems it helps the stimulation of our digestive system it stimulates the development of our uh neural pathways they found that when babies um were raised in environments so babies who were um orphans there was a time when they were in uh let's say in a hospital where babies their mothers weren't available either they passed away or they were given up for adoption and they would have like one nurse for all these babies and there wasn't a whole lot of touch happening 
And these babies weren't surviving. And they didn't understand why were these babies, you know, they weren't surviving. They were not, their, their, their systems, their hearts weren't developing, their digestive systems. Even were, though they were being fed and exactly, all that stuff. yeah. And then what they realized is that touch is not just about um, uh, uh, an expression of care, but it's actually necessary for thriving, for our development of our system and the health of the system. Our immune system is dependent on this sense of touch. So it goes way beyond just like, ah, you know, just to feel good. Yeah. You know, there's, there's benefits to that, but it's yeah. necessary. But then, so let's say, you know, I, I injure my, my quad, my quad muscle, my quadriceps and, um, I, I go for, you know, to see a massage therapist. And as soon as, you know, I, I feel that touch on my leg, immediate sense of comfort. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's extreme if someone goes too hard or whatever. But assuming we found the right, uh, yes. you know, pressure, yeah, um, it feels relieving. It feels like now I can very easily put my attention towards yes. that area once there is touch. Same like yesterday, whether it was your hand or my hand, but whatever area I touched, it's very easy now to put my attention towards that area. So, you know, when I played with uh, meditation, um, we're just laying or just sitting, mm -hmm. focusing on the breath helps. Yes. Um, but I found that touch is a is a easier way to gr to grab your attention, um, especially if it's an external touch of mm. someone touching you from the outside. So I felt safe with you. You touch me. I can almost sink into that touch, throw all my attention towards that area. Um, so going to a, uh, you know, and I mentioned this example to you yesterday of, you know, being a, a former athlete, being injured, seeing players injured all the time, um, players getting treated all the time, you know, different massages or different, you know, electrotherapies, all these different gadgets and things that they have nowadays. Um, but undergoing treatment for areas of your body that are hurt, that are fatigued, that are sore, that are torn, that are strained. But someone might get treatment on their calf muscle with touch. And the person who is, you know, administering the treatment might be doing everything right. Mm -hmm. But if the person, let's say, for example, me receiving the treatment, um, maybe I'm sleeping Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm on my phone on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, so almost I'm distracting myself from throwing all my attention towards that area. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do we know yet, um, mm. like disassociating the receptors from your brain from that area of pain, mm -hmm. does that prevent healing to mm. some degree? You know, and I think about that a lot of time with, um, and I'm very in interested in this when it comes to chronic pain. Um, when something hurts somewhere in the body, if it's there for X amount of days, whatever that threshold is, mm -hmm. maybe at that moment, that threshold, it just, it becomes easier to experience the pain daily than, than it is to, on a daily basis, send, you know, your attention to that, mm. to that area. Because I find that something very hard to do. I don't know why yet. I'm discovering why it's way easier for me to go on a 60-minute run than to meditate for three minutes. <laughs> okay, well, that was a, a lot of different things. A lot there. of different... I know, <laughs> I know, I know. But it is, somehow it seems uh, linked for you. And let's see. I think, it, But I think the common denominator his, his, here is um, the difficulty yeah. of actually... Paying attention. Okay, yes. I think what you're you're speaking to is that what I've discovered is that there's a part of me that is open, curious, that can be, um, yeah, almost non-judgmental. It has a perspective of my experience of like, hmm, check that out. This is happening. And then there's another part of me that is um, that can be a little vigilant, critical, 
it's protect it's, it has a protective quality now in um, therapy and in how the nervous system works, they would call that there's the, um, the two parts of the nervous system. That's either, um, the parasympathetic, which is the part it's when the nervous system is, um, in thrive mode, what they call rest and digest mode. And then you have the other part of the nervous system, which is fight or flight. It's, um, it's vigilant to finding safety. Now, I think those two are always, are always in, you know, they're always there working together. I think that vigilant part, as soon as we're in a new environment is going to like scan the room, you know, like it's, you know, we walked into this room at first, we're like, what is this space? Am I going to feel comfortable here? You know, like, but it's all this lighting. Am I going to be safe being seen? That's our it's natural that yep. we have a kind of protector part of us. And then I can have choice to like take a few breaths. I can, I can have a dialogue with say, it's safe. I'm in good hands. These guys know what they're doing. So there's these two parts of having a dialogue with each other. Yeah. And so I think the same thing is happening when you say like, oh, it's hard for me to focus on my body. I think what it is, is that there's a, it, it, it depends on like what part of you is trying to focus on your body. Like, are you focusing on your body because you have an agenda? Like, because I want to get rid of this pain. Am I wanting to focus on my body? Because usually there's an agenda that we have because we don't like what's happening. Yeah. Now here's the thing. If we think about our body as a sentience, and it has personality. It has it's 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 a it's something we're having a dialogue with. Imagine that if you are responding and saying, "Hey, I don't like what's happening there," and it's saying, "Here, I'm trying to communicate information to you," it's going to feel rejected by you. It's going to feel distrustful because you have an agenda with it. So there's tens. T- so this is the challenge: is that I need this quadricep thing to get out of the way so that I can Mm. do my run so I can it's like in the way of what I want to do and the body it's like sometimes it holds expressions like um like a child that's wanting your attention and if you're just gonna you know and the child makes a lot of noise trying to get your attention And if you just like, you just like, okay, well, what can I give you? Can I give you like this to shut you up? Or can I, uh, that's very different than, than like taking times. Like, what do you need for me to know? What, what's happening right now? You you know, does that make sense? It it does make sense. Um, Also, you gave me a new way of looking at it. Um, So to try and like communicate with the body without a specific agenda. Yes. Um, and you've, and you've seen that like do wonders for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and when in, in your session specifically, um, like, especially when, if someone maybe is new, uh, comes, you know, to you for the first time, um, what would be like best case scenario of, you know, someone leaving the room that day for you? Um, mm. Also, I don't know. You know, I don't know the the, uh, the the rate of people that maybe stick with this. I don't mm. know. Maybe you can tell me. Mm. Um, but you no, know, when someone comes for the first time, it's it can seem you know out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, what is it we we can do or that you do to um, at least get someone curious about it and to see that there? I don't know. Again, I'm I don't know how to uh, label the communication, uh, but there is that intelligence. There is that communication there Mm. um so how do we get people to be more curious at at the least Mm. from my perspective also i I also see that as something that's maybe uh i I could be wrong but as a challenge for someone like yourself in your field yes yeah because i can easily as a practitioner try and have an agenda (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i it's so easy for me also to slip into that same kind of, uh, I want you to get to a certain place. I want you to 
be open and receptive to what I have to offer, right? Now that I have to watch for that because that agenda will be felt by your nervous system as pressure, as maybe even like, um, yeah, usually it can fit, be felt like pressure or it might make you feel like you're not getting it right. Yeah. And I have to watch for that because I want, what I'm always interested in is how can you, uh, how can you f feel like as if you've tapped into a resource that is uh, useful, that is that gives you a sense of a different kind of knowing, different from like the certainty we were talking about, but a knowing of like, it's all good. I'm good. In fact, what if there's nothing to fix but I have all that I need right here. Like I'm already, there's so much goodness of who you are. It's just a matter of how can I listen to that goodness and how it wants to express itself. And that's really where I see the success is like, and that could be just in that moment of noticing the tyrant. If I, in, in a session of all that someone gets out of it, that they notice that they are hard on themselves, and then they notice that voice is a separate part, that it's not all of them, that that tyrant voice is just their nervous system shifting into, it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them. It's just a, there's some information there that's wanting to be known, that's trying to take care of you. And what if you could be in dialogue with that part and go, hey, Thank you for watching out for me. And I want to like have you still be, have you watch my back, but I want to collaborate with you so that you don't have to tell me no and stop my creative expression of who I am because you think it's going to be, it's, uh, it, it's not going to be received or safe or it has to be a certain way. Or if I, if I feel these deep emotions that I'm, I'm going to lose my mind or if I feel these deep emotions, I'm going to be judged as being weak. Um, Are there dangers to this practice? Dangers. <laughs> can, can one slip, uh, you know, too deep? Uh, can one um, get too much communication? Uh, can one rely too much on the communication within and not have a balance with a tyrant up top, um, have you? Yeah, have you seen that? Well, yeah. So this is um, so. I think, like I said, I think it's important not to vilify the part of our nervous system that's watching out for our back, right? Because if we're out there, let's say if we're going for a hike in the mountains, and we come across a bear or a mountain lion. Mm -hmm. We want that part of our nervous system to like respond. Yeah. We don't want that taken out of our nervous system. It's it's useful that's there. But what if we could partner with it? So I think again it's about coming back to this idea of collaboration. That if we try and be islands on our on our on our own and we try and separate ourselves from these parts, we create tension. I think that's the danger. I think, in fact, the danger is in not listening. The more we don't listen, the more we create separation from a truth and we create a buildup of undigested information that when we turn towards it, we might feel a little overwhelmed and blah, blah, blah. You know, I think the danger is in like that. There can be possibly people become obsessed with what they're feeling, but that's coming from, again, a trying to get it right, mm, an agenda. right? Yeah. Again, agenda part. Yeah. So we have to watch for like the, yeah, the, what's our intention? And so um, I find it's helpful to, for me to set up always a time in my day where I might set a timer of where it be an agenda -less time where I go, okay, what's here now? So that's where, you know, you've heard in like meditation, they just set a timer, <clears throat> whatever that works for you. It could be five minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just setting that timer. And within that time, 
turning towards the body and there's and maybe engaging different things. So some people, breath helps them. Touch, we know that for you. Touch is probably your entry point. Oh, yeah, I would say breath is too, by yeah. the way. Just, I, th- I thought the touch was like a, sh- a better shortcut. Yeah, well, no, but it, they found um, that each nervous system can have a primary. Mm. Touch, movement. Some people, they need to move first to get in contact with their body sense. Some people feel the energy, like the aliveness mm-hmm. of themselves, and that becomes the doorway. And then breath, movement, sound can be the things that. And so being in that inquiry of what's here now and allowing one to respond to it, so through movement, through breath, through sound, um, can be a way of like uh, getting into the habit of the agendaless part of us and that we can then recognize the contrast when we start activating the the agenda so i mean because to me that sounds like a good starting point for really anyone um is to set a an amount of time whatever it is that person can afford to spend um away from the checklist and almost see what happens yeah like without entertainment, without a phone, without anything, and almost to focus on the breathe, and that's meditation in a sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you only hear people say that when they dedicate that effort and that time to look within, um, you know, away from the agenda, away from the checklist, that it does work wonders for people right like again that's it's almost like all you hear when you read about those things Mm. um the negative side around those things i think is the skepticism whether it will pay benefit so it's usually not people that have done it for 20 years and then saying i wasted my time for 20 years Mm -hmm. it's people that have tried it maybe uh you know a few times and have made their conclusions very quickly. So I feel like even something like this that we're talking about, your type, and so what can we, is it somatic therapy? Can we categorize it as that? Um, Well, I wouldn't, let's see, because there is somatic therapy, so there's therapist, and um, and then there's somatic, I mean, it's it the, right now, it's expanding, mm-hmm. right? It's, there's somatic coaching, um, somatic body work, um, it's all, there's this like whole, uh, field now it's growing and there's amazing research happening with it too. The usefulness, the, like the resource of this body knowing and connection in, in the work that I'm doing because of my background coming from, um, being a body worker, massage therapist, and then also being a embodiment facilitator. So I would call myself, like you could call me, call myself an embodiment coach, embodiment facilitator. And I've trained in a lot of somatic work where um, what they call like trauma informed. So I have, I've done some study of like how to recognize different trauma responses and how to partner with trauma, but I am not a, I'm not a trained psychotherapist. So that's a whole other field that you can take something, this, 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 uh, this body sense, this somatic language, and you can, you can put it into therapy, somatic therapy. You can put it into life coaching. It, uh, you can put it into body work. You can put it even into, um, now physical training, like, uh, physical fitness, right? Mindfulness, uh, meditation, this, uh, uh, the, this body sense that's connected to the intelligence that is, connected to the intelligence that animates the universe it's like vast it's so big and it's so it has so much resource to it so when we go into what's been discovered in the um therapy realm right the what in psychotherapy 
they have been working with um, in in trauma, like people who have had severe traumas, the more they can get people to uh, slowly find trust in their bodies again, are the ones that start to heal from the trauma. They start to find more um, uh, self-reliance. So, so learning to trust the body exactly. or regain trust because, because that, that, so yeah, because I was going to say the, there is a, definitely a feeling there, you know, if, if I go on a run and I tweak my, uh, my calf, yeah. a sense of disappointment, a sense of betrayal yes. of that area of the body. Yeah. Yeah. And so it takes a lot to be able to come into that trust. Um, I think that's why we need each other. So like, even you were asking about the question of touch. Touch makes it so that um, you can find trust in in your environment, in in other, right? Which is it's trusting also uh, uh, that there's something to trust in that we can we can do this together. Yeah. So I think that's for people who have experienced trauma that they have someone to support them to rebuild that trust. Um, that's why it's so important to even that to look at the environment that people live in. Who are we um, spending time with? How we're spending our time is just as important as this inner uh, investigation. Because it's communication, also yeah. energy, and and so just like what you're saying, when you go for that run, again, it's like, what is why you know what is your agenda to run? Like what if the run was like the experience itself and it's inclusive of that that little tweak in your calf is about your body saying, hey, you need to pay attention to how your foot's making contact to the ground. Like when I, when I do those, it's like I have to slow down a little bit and then I can start to sense like, oh, I'm running on the a little bit on the outside of my foot. So if I shift a little bit more to my center, my heel, oh, now my my calf is not pulling because I'm not getting this tug of war happening in my own body system. So sometimes those little tweaks are actually your body. It's like the sensor in, our, in these cars now that say that we're coming close to something. And so if you approach it more as information, as opposed to like it's in the way of your run mm. or what you're trying to get to. Yeah. Because we do that. We don't approach it as information. We approach it as an obstacle. Exactly. Um that's interesting, yeah. Because like, see, I'm, so I'm 53, right? So I've I've crossed that threshold. Um, so even because as a woman, as I've crossed the threshold that now I've gone through menopause, right? And so there's a marker I've experienced that now I'm going into like, you know, my crone years, whatever. Like, so I know um, I've had that experience of like where in my younger years, it's like it was all about like what I could, you know, uh, trying to get somewhere, achieve something, you know, how strong can I be? How flexible? How can I be the best Pilates instructor or the best body worker? Right. And then now when I've gotten to this stage in my life, I realize there's always, it's never ending to get to the best. Mm -hmm. What if I could be more in, uh, connected to the experience? And then all of a sudden, there's a richness of the now moment that I'm connecting. I'm always adjusting to, oh, my body is in this state, what its needs are. And then there's a whole different enjoyable experience that happens that maybe I did get out of like when I was able to do that run and I got the endorphins. But there's a different resource of enjoyable experience that's not dependent on how much output, but it's more about falling back into the enjoyable experience of who I, what's happening. That's inclusiveness to I'm engaged. Yeah, I'm not just like meditating and staying just exactly still. I'm responding to that aliveness in me. And in that response, it's inclusive like, oh, I felt like oh, I was holding tension in this arm. Let me just adjust. Let me relax that. What is that about? Oh, I'm I'm getting a little bit like, oh, I want to try and get it, this clarity of what I'm expressing to you. 
that happens every once in a while. It's like yep. my agenda happens and it's natural and it can partner with the part of me that can be accepting of this now moment. Yeah. I wanted to ask you earlier about, um, about again, your sessions. What is the difference for you when it comes to like a, a seated session versus a laying down session mm. with a client? Um, well, when, when I share things like, um, cause when I do embodiment work, uh, uh, like when I've done workshops and retreats, we explore all different, uh, ways of being in the body because so we might do things standing. We might do things in motion yeah. because how can I stay connected to this body intelligence throughout my day? And if I only do things on a table and seated, then like that can create this, uh, too much, uh, contrast to like, how can I weave that into my everyday life? So, um, so seated helps that level of engagement because already being upright, your nervous system mm. is alert. Sometimes when people are laying on a table, they might fall asleep. Um, I see. So you get different uh, elements to yeah, you your get, session. Yeah, exactly. Um, so sometimes I might uh, invite that seated so that their nervous system gets habituated to the practice of connecting to their felt sense. Yeah. I might invite you to stand up and get your legs engaged. Maybe we might move around the room and uh, explore how what how do your body wants to move in space. Um all different ways of exploring embodiment so that there's a habit of like when you're engaged in your life, that it's there with you. It's always there in the background, that knowing and, uh, yeah. and you can partner with it. Absolutely makes sense. Um, I have two more things to ask you. Mm -hmm. Difficult questions. One, I'm, I'm um, unfortunately I'm uh, in my brain, I'm stuck in the world, uh, not stuck, but I'm very associated I associate things with the world of athletics, mm -hmm. um, of performance, because I think um, I just think that you know we, we we very much here on the podcast as well. We talk a lot about injuries and treatments and things yeah. like that, and recovery and you know uh, long term health and longevity. Uh, but when it comes to athletics, yeah, it's a different world because the ecosystem is about performance and winning. Like yeah. regardless of how you feel or what, you have to win that weekend. You know, yeah. Um, do you, just your opinion, mm. like, do you think, let's say, you know, if we took um, all of the NBA players, every single one of them, and we were able to get every single one of them mm. to take the time every day mm. to connect with their bodies without an agenda, mm -hmm. do you think that at the end of that process, however long it takes, mm. do we have better basketball players? <laughs> That's wow. a question that I pose to myself all the time. Yeah. And not just about, you know, this practice. Yeah. But about different mind body yeah. connection practices. Well, because I don't the, because, I don't know about their yeah. performance, mm -hmm. but I do know that you might get um more more connected human beings. No one cares about the human beings. Well, see this. <laughs> and exactly. So yeah. um I do think that it I mean, because I think there is a lot of, uh, that's a realm I haven't done as much study, but I think more and more NBA players are practicing mindfulness, I think so right? too. I think so yeah. too. But I just think that the majority are not. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, some of the top athletes are engaging in mindfulness. And also we do know that they do struggle with mental health, mm -hmm. right? The pressure. Um, and then those that when they are, when they retire, they feel lost in their lives, right? So I think that there's also, by the way, the uh, like you said, there's always more to achieve. Like, exactly. Um, you see a lot of depression coming into top athletes when they win. Yeah, and then they lose a sense of connection to who are they, because that identity is so uh, isolated. And so I think that um, it'd be very interesting to uh, support them in that. Uh, investigating of who they are on a feeling sense, because that feeling sense, again, is connected to the larger intelligence that connects us all, that animates us all, right? That uh, activates the rhythms of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're made up of the same elements of the earth, that same intelligence. Like if you think about the mystery of what beats our hearts, 
Like, where does that come from? That electrical impulse? And that intelligence is in us. And if we take the time just to like be in the awe of it, that then allows us to connect to something that is bigger than us and that we are made up of that. And I don't know, to me, that really touches me. And uh, I don't know if that really answered your question. <laughs> oh, something I'll keep exploring. You know, I, I, just, I just wondered, you know, because also... Um, from an agenda from an agenda perspective yeah. um whether these practices you know can like for you know for example the you know um, top athletes get massages yeah not because we want them to be better human beings but because we want them to avoid injuries or recover right. from it Th there's an agenda uh -huh. but it's a practice so if they if they adopted practices like this as, as a you know systematically not mm -hmm. individuals maybe that you know their wife recommended they go see someone like yourself and then they mm -hmm. you know see that it can help them and they like it but systematically if these were things that were almost imposed on developing athletes as kids yeah. And just as you learn to sprint as fast as you can, you yeah. also learn to connect with your body as much yeah. as you can whether that will also help the agenda of winning. Yeah. Um, so I know it was a difficult question. Just, I just wondered your opinion. It brings yeah, me yeah. to again to this place of like, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's great. I think there is something in the expression of like athleticism. There's like, um, you know, often athletes will, will talk about that, 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 um, that, that moment of where they're not in thought. The rhythm of nature. They're just like, they're just, they're this in the doingness, the beingness, yeah. and there's a oneness to it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an expression of this intelligence. So, and, and that's what I'm touching on as well, because those moments are super rare for any athlete. Yes. They happen, mm -hmm. but super rare. Um, so maybe more mind-body connection can almost allow those players to disassociate from the tyrant or, you know, the... The, the the brain making all the small decisions mm. kind of easing into what the body already knows how to do yeah maybe that'll create more moments like that and i think it means to be inclusive of um uh, of like what what does the tyrant feel like in the body like the more we can identify the limits and the and how how the the tyrant what does it feel like? Like it actually has a feeling sense. I know like my tyrant, it it's like in my shoulders and I get like, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, my shoulders are, is like, I can take it. And I actually feel like as if I have like, like football pads on my shoulders and I'm like, mm -hmm. and I definitely like yeah. physically I have broad shoulders. There's a development in my body that's happened as a result of years of like my, my meeting life in a certain way. Um, so if the more I, I like, I say hello there, cause it's always, it's a part of me, but I give it, I tell it like, okay, you can be there, but you're not in charge of the show. Yep. You're not running it. You're in service to something greater. In service to, yep. And then it changes. Like that part of me starts to like, I can start to feel the relief in it. I can start to feel like, oh, it's. Um, there's a curiosity of like how, how I can be different. Like I can feel like, oh, I'm, I want to stretch in a different way. I'm moving. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. it gives me a sense of like my mobility. Um, and then it's like, oh. Yeah. The, um, for, to celebrate this milestone of 35 episodes, um, I want to pose a question to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> and if this goes well, I'm going to pose this to every single guest mm -hmm. that, uh, comes on the show. What is, you've been practicing now for 30 years. Yeah. Um, what is one thing that maybe sticks with you or you're most surprised by that you've changed your opinion on over time that maybe mm. 25 years ago or 15 years ago or five mm. days ago? You um, were almost certain. I know that um, we spoke about not being certain, like we like not being certain about things because who the hell knows anything. But we still, our lives are built out of many certainties. That So you have your certainties, I have my certainties that help us get through the day. Um, 
So what is something that maybe a certainty that you had that you changed your mind of on? Wow, that that question really touches me. I, I know. I should like... I should have told you about it yesterday too to no, help to give you time to prepare. I, I love being surprised. Like when emotion <laughs> comes up to me, I know like I'm I'm in touch with something that feels uh, important. Like for me, when I when I when I get connected to something real in me, it activates this like it's like coming home to something. Like when you come home to someone that you haven't been with in a long time, and it activates this kind of like I can feel the little bit of tears like at the forefront and um, the it's uh, what I'm surprised by is the more I enter in this inquiry and I start to like trust the imperfection of life, I find there's like, there's an excitement and um I find myself meeting life in a different way, in a way that's more relaxed. And in being relaxed, um, there's, there's like, there's, there's like something new, fresh happening. I'm surprised, like, um, and it's enjoyable. And I'm, and, and then I'm like more engaged in life in a way from a place of, Mm, not trying so hard, but like it's all about like in, enjoying the moment. So, what surprises you maybe is that more comes with it than you expected from taking yeah. a step back and relaxing. And it's like I always had this sense that if I, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing enough, if I wasn't on top of my doing this. I wouldn't be enough. Like life wouldn't meet me. Yeah. It wouldn't support me. That it was all up to me on how much I was doing. So then I would start to judge myself of like, um, yeah, the not enoughness. Uh, so that would might turn into like, oh, you're lazy or you need to learn how to express yourself better or write better or um, whatever it is. It's endless. The the not enoughness. Yeah. And the more I can relax into, um, yeah, that the now moment isn't enough. And I know it's like, what does that mean, now moment? It's like, I don't have to know it all. Like even in this exchange, like I'm enjoying how like you've, you've got this, right? And I get to just show up and be my quirky self and like, you know how I'm expressing myself, and you you're meeting me back with it. I don't have to work hard at it. Yeah. And in that, there's like an enjoyable quality that feels like I'm surfing, I'm surfing life, and it's still like sometimes it's like uh, edgy, it's exciting, it's yeah. it's it's moving me along, and I need to make sure I rest. I need to make sure I replenish, um, so that I can stay present to that that wave that's carrying me. Yeah. And take care of some of the to-do lists, probably. Exactly. To stay on the wave. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes my body says, it, it actually says it wants to just get things done. It would feel more relieved. Like my body will say that. Yeah, yeah. It wants that. Yeah. Um, and, and you feel that, I feel that feeling. I feel that feeling, especially when I take, when I take time off. You know, when you you book a couple of days in a, in a, in a retreat or in a hotel and almost you're forcing yourself by booking and by planning mm -hmm. to take the time off. Um, and then usually for me, at least after those moments off, yeah. even if it's an afternoon or a day or two or a week or a month, yeah. your body speaks to you that there, there still was a to-do list and there still is a balance. And if you want to ride a wave, you need to be on a wave you know, if you're standing on the sand, you're not going to be riding the wave. <laughs> That's true. Um, so you want to be on a wave and you yeah. want to partner with the different elements of yourself, as you uh, mentioned so nicely uh, throughout this um, this episode. And we've been uh, riding this wave for like 90 minutes, give or take. <laughs> uh, so I hope it uh, was enjoyable to you. Um, do you want to just uh, say to uh, people listening also mm. your website, where they can find you, where they can learn about more about what you do? Yes. And obviously we'll have an online course uh, packaged and ready to go sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, super excited about it. Um, but then you have your platform. So please. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
yeah, so you can uh, find out more about me, uh, laracolasar.com. Also, this might be also easier for, I have also bodyasmuse.com. Uh, so the body as this uh, you know, source of inspiration, bodyasmuse.com. And um, I offer online workshops, uh, classes, and courses, as well as uh, I've, I lead um, live workshops and retreats, uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, yeah, and then, of course, we just finished doing this course, so this is going to be... Um, a course on developing a somatic language for body workers. Um, the exact titling will be done by, <laughs> yep. by, and this will be found on, um, on neilasher.com, NAT global campus. Yes. Um, yeah. so super exciting. I was, you know, great meeting you finally, um, great working with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and great, great having you, uh, here as a guest. So Lara, thank you very much for being here. Mm, thank you so much, Danny.